Okay. So the technology is cooperating a little bit better. Um, it looks like the the um, it looks like the videos are coming up on on YouTube, so that they're there at least. One one last thing, right? That we are um, seeing it come together a little bit. So the recording started. All right. So we we talked about the state a lot, and one of the reasons why I sort of was repetitive and and sort of really wanted to cover this a lot is because there has to be this basic understanding of, of how comparative politics works, right? We started with science, right? Comparative politics, science and comparative politics, right? And one of the things about early in the course about science was that we had to have sort of the variables clearly identified, science works in a specific way, right? Are we looking at qualitative versus quantitative, you know? Are we looking at case studies? Case studies become a very important thing in comparative politics. And so we set the science of it. And then we set up what regime types there are. Because we always want to think about this, okay, how, what is the system, the system that, that works? How, how does the system work in that state, right? Is it autocratic? Is it democratic? Is it some sort of hybrid regime? Is it competitive authoritarian? Competitive authoritarian? Because it's a really great way to look at a lot of states that say, okay, they have electoral rules and people are allowed to run for office, but there's some sort of reason why it's not functional. So we wanted to set all this up so that when we ask questions about which one is better at taxing and producing resources, which one, which one, which type of regime functions to serve its, its citizens better and the goals of those citizens, we know what we're talking about, right? And so we're gonna do a quick review of terms, right? I don't like quotes, but I want I want you to see the reason I quoted this time is I want you to see how, how the wording's different. But we're really trying to get at the same thing. And so when we're talking about a political regime, I, I just want you to think about the rules and the institutions that exist about who can be in charge and how decisions are made, right? I, I don't need you to have Chibub's, Chibub's um, definition No, You don't need to know that, right? Because um, Krasner's definition of regimes is different than Chibub's definition of regimes. What really matters here is what are the institutions and the rules about how decisions are made, right? Whether this be production and allocation of public resources, right? How you tax and how you spend those taxes. Whether it be about who can run for office. Regimes are really about the rules that exist before people compete, right? And, and Sabellis has, has a book about this, right? The rules about the game, right? And we talked about this before, right? You don't just come to a state and it's democracy. The elites that exist in that state, they, they try to make those rules, they try to influence those rules. In the same way that kids, when they start to play a game, they make rules about how that game is played, right? So this is part of the regime, right? These rules exist, but they didn't just spring up naturally. There was a game before the game about what rules existed. Now, when he talks about democracy in this paper, he really is talking about Gaul's definition, right? This polyarchy, the seven criteria, and then pluralism and checks and balances, right? A full democracy. Now, Chibov is not concerned about a level playing field. It's just that, that's not a discussion that really exists that much. That's why Levitsky and Wade's book is so important, is because it introduces this new thing. But Chibov writes before this. So really, it's Dahl's definition that we're using here. We're saying that. And a dictatorship. Now, a dictatorship is really, in its definition, just a single leader, right? He can't be challenged electorally, right? He's in charge, and he's going to be in charge, right? So, right, very rarely is someone a dictator, right? Very rarely is someone a dictator, because it implies that they rule that they rule and they, they don't have to have some sort of base of support, right? But in reality, it's much more likely that they're an oligarch, right? Russia is an oligarchy, right? We have like a small group that, that is controlling that system, right? A small group of very wealthy sort of leaders, right, who own a great deal of, of wealth and resources in Russia support Putin and Putin is, is the executive. But Putin isn't a dictator. He has to answer to his elites, right? And so dictators are very rare, um, and so 
Now he uses that term, he's really talking about an autocratic or an authoritarian regime. We talked about express, if, extracted capacity, right? Now, extracted capacity and state capacity, they get used together a lot because the amount of money you take in is how much capacity your state has. But extracted capacity is just taxation and rents, right? How much income, how much revenue are you pulling in um, to perform actions, right? You, you can only perform services with the money you take in, unless you're going into debt, and we'll talk about deficit spending in a little bit. So the question becomes, is regime, does any regime type increase extractive capacity, right? Can, right, and, and they start to create, and we'll talk about this through gardens, dictatorships, can they have unpopular behaviors, right? They don't have to respond, so maybe they can have unpopular behaviors, but also democracies, we talked about in contract theory before, right? That in democracies, you can get popular support. They can say, yeah, you can tax me, but you have to do certain things for me. I'm willing to pay taxes if you do certain things for me. And then on the other side, right, which is why this is a much more complicated argument, is because theoretically and historically, we've seen the opposite, right? That maybe they can't have as much extractive capacity because of a few things, right? Dictators, they rely on these really small groups. So because they're so reliant on the elites, we see things. We talk about in the history of England, right? England couldn't always raise taxes because it was so reliant on its on its on its feudal lords, right? They had to be uh, they had to approve of new taxes because of the limit on the monarchy. And then also a coup de, coup d'état, right? A forceful takeover, right? Now dictators they want to get more taxes from their elites, but if they tax their elites too heavily, right, or if they pull too much extractive capacity from the elites that exist, those elites will remove that person from office and replace them because the elites can control all the military. And remember, elites can be landowners, they can be merchants, but they can also be military leaders, right? Your generals are always very dangerous, right, to, to a dictator because that general controls the military and can just say, well, now we're going to take over the capital, right? This is Egypt today, right? El Sisi, um, General El Sisi, he saw what the Muslim Brotherhood was doing in Egypt. He knew that the international community wouldn't stop him if he, if he took over. He took over through a coup, right? It was bloodless because he controlled the military. The Muslim Brotherhood doesn't have its own military. So the Egyptian military takes over and it stops this sort of democratic experience and puts it back into an authoritarian regime. So dictators can't just, they may not be as good at extracting capacity. They might be so busy trying to balance the interests that they can't raise as much money, right? So that, that goes against the first argument that they're better at collecting taxes. And then, right, obviously the, the most common argument we hear about democracies and why taxes are low is because they care more about re-election, right? That I'm not gonna risk losing my office, losing my incumbent behavior. I wanna stay in power, and so I'm not gonna pass on popular taxes, and so taxation may not increase even when it needs to increase, right? You might say, I have to have taxes in order to support the resources or the, or the services that we're already performing. Well, I also don't want to get elected. And there's a book called the, the Electoral Connection, Congress Electoral Connection. And so if you are a political science major, you're gonna eventually read David Mayhew. I mean, Mayhew's book is, is everywhere. So, um, right, and, and the argument is that it's rational, right? If you're in office, it's rational for you to want to stay in office, and therefore you're gonna prioritize elections over right, over substantive results, right? You might need to raise taxes and provide services for the community that you're serving, but your first goal is re-election. And, and Mayhew is very ambivalent about, about whether or not people are even rational. Um, but his book is often cited about this behavior of, of elections versus substantive results. So let's go into um, these theory-driven arguments. And so the first part is that in a democracy, voters determine the taxation level, right? And they want some optimal level of, of taxation. And this optimal level is just enough tax revenue to pay for the services, right? If the services are 100 million, then taxes should be 100 million, right? And the percentage is and taxes, right? It should be just barely enough to cover the cost. And this becomes sort of a weird behavior because taxation 
has a negative impact on economic growth. Typically has a negative impact on economic growth, short-term economic growth, right? If I tax people more this year, then they're going to spend less in the economy, and then the growth from, from last year to this year is going to be smaller. So single-year growth declines with taxation. Now, over a longer period of time, taxation can, can actually improve things because of the infrastructure investment and investment in technology. Right? We talked about South Korea, right? South Korea actually had slightly higher taxes in order to fund its infant industry of the infant automobile industry, right? And they've developed economically through those taxes, right? Higher taxes, labor suppression, right? Short-term authoritarian behavior for economic growth, right? Whereas democracies typically don't do that. And so that's the argument. Now, that explains why you don't have as high of taxes in democracies. The other part is that in an autocracy, an authoritarian government, elites determine the taxation level. So you typically have higher taxation because elites are willing to have a higher taxation for certain factors, and they can tax the public, right? The people who are not elites, the people who are just working, they can tax them at a higher rate because they don't have a say. One of the things that we see that is sort of changes this behavior is, is concerns about the future. Now, this article is going to talk about this a bit, so I'm only going to touch on it really quickly. If you're worried about losing power, you're like, oh, in four years, they want to have this referendum, and I might be knocked out of power. What you might do is what Mubarak did. Uh, Mubarak was the leader of Egypt be before the, the, the Arab Spring. And he took in as much money as he could, and he took it from the government, and he put it into his private bank account. Right? Mubarak is alive. He's, in a, he's exiled. He can't go back to Egypt. But he's got like billions of dollars, right? billions of dollars in gold. And so this is what's called a kleptocracy, right? a kleptocracy. And a kleptocracy is where the leaders, the, the leaders in authoritarian regime, a, a, a somewhat authoritarian regime, because there were elections and other behaviors, but Mubarak was in power for a very long time. In a kleptocracy, you start taking money, the taxes and the rents and the revenues that are coming into the state, and you start transferring them to your personal bank account. Or you start changing the property, right? The property, the, if there's an oil well or if there is a, um, if there's some sort of mine, right? You just say, oh yeah, that's always been my land, right? Because you're in control of the documents, you're in control of the government. So anytime something valuable pops up, you say, oh, that's mine, right? Or, right? Whether or not you hide it or you sort of make it seem like it, right? Kleptocracies are very common, uh, is a very common term used to describe a lot of these because the leaders are pulling wealth out of the system. And they're pulling wealth out of the system. The other part is pool proofing, right? And then, and we've talked about this as well, right? That, that you need to bring in all this money, but you need to bring all this money so that you're prepared, right? With a, you, you spend more on a security detail to protect yourself from military leaders, right? That the Muslim Brotherhood were at risk, right? They needed to provide their own protection, and because they didn't, right? El Sisi was able to take control of them. And Egypt becomes an authoritarian regime rather than uh, um, the Muslim Brotherhood is a political party that exists in many countries, and they won elections after the Arab Spring, and so they were democratically elected um, to to govern um, in Egypt. And I want to say the, the executive, the president's name was Morrissey, but I could be wrong about that pronunciation. And he wanted all of these reforms. And the reforms weren't popular in the international community, and they seemed like they weren't going to be as effective, and they weren't providing jobs and other things to the population. And so the population wasn't as resistant to El Sisi coming and taking over, right? He, he took over, but whether or not he has popular support is a little unclear, right? Because always in authoritarian regimes, you get, right? No one's going to say, I hate the leader in an authoritarian regime, because that puts you at risk. And then, right, Haitian Shahs, right? If you're an authoritarian leader, right, remember what I said about dictators, they don't rule alone, they need their elites. And so if you need the support of elites, you start saying, okay, well, you support me in, in allowing higher taxation, and then you and, and many of the other people in your group, I'm gonna give them jobs in the government, and the government's gonna pay them out some salary for a job that's not very difficult, right? Haitian Shahs always exist, um, they're just, Patronage jobs exist in all governments, right? If we look, if we look, um, I'm sure this is true in all administrations, but the, the last time that I saw a concrete example in the U.S. is, is the Obama administration. 
Um, and I'm not pointing out, I'm just saying this is the last time I saw it. I'm sure it happened in the Trump administration. I'm sure it will happen in the Biden administration. So we saw ambassadors, and this is actually quite common everywhere in, in all states. An ambassador in a, in a democratic system, the ambassador in smaller states are often appointed by someone who did really well at campaigning and, and funding the person who wins. So the reason I'm mentioning the Obama administration is because there was one obvious example. Um, I want to say Trinidad and Tobago or Costa Rica. An ambassador was set to be the, the ambassador to a small state. And one of the things is when you have these small states, it's not difficult. Like it's not a difficult job to be ambassador, right? The trade relations are sort of set. And if there are trade negotiations, the ambassador doesn't handle them. That's handled by the, the secretary of the treasury or it's handled by the secretary of state, right? But the ambassador doesn't handle this aspect of, of trade. There isn't really defense issues. There aren't that many problems um, that the ambassador has to handle. So they don't have to be as qualified. Right, the ambassador to China and Russia typically appointees not based on patronage because they have to be very qualified. But in these smaller states, it's a patronage system. So in the Obama administration, one of these individuals, the reason why he was offered this job is because he raised about $250,000, over $250,000 for the Obama administration. Right? He helped raise funds for the campaign and then he was rewarded with a patronage job. Now, the United States is still a democracy, right? Incumbents have advantages in all governments, right? That doesn't mean, but that point is, is that always exists. The difference between an autocratic government or an authoritarian government doing that and a democratic government doing that, right? When they both have patronage jobs, is that this one doesn't change the outcome of who is in charge, right? Whoever wins then has patronage jobs to assign, but they can't, as an incumbent, they can't use that to their advantage. Right? And there's a high uncertainty. Remember we talked about this in the last section. In, an, in a democratic election, right, all the people who supported Trump in this last election cycle or who reported, or are supporting Merkel, uh, Angela Merkel in, in Germany, if she loses or when Trump loses the election, right, you have those people who provide all that support, they don't get anything out of it. They don't get patronage because right? their side lost. And so that's how you know it's democratic is because both sides are getting support, and whoever wins is going to get out patronage jobs, but we don't know who's going to win. Right? In an authoritarian government, we know who's going to win, and that person is also providing patronage jobs. And that's what makes it different from an incumbent advantage and an uneven playing field. And so these three things, you have higher taxation because you have to provide for these patronage jobs. You have to protect yourself from a coup, and you have kleptocracies where you're filling your bank accounts with the government uh, revenue. And so this very first argument is we expect democracies to tax less, right? They don't want to upset their voters, right? Whereas authoritarian groups don't, don't have that issue. And so from year to year, democracies will tax less and have more economic growth, right? So that's the first part of the argument. The second part of the argument is the entire opposite. And, and this is, a lot of times when we're dealing with this, one of the problems is that we're looking at different horizons different times, right? From one year to the next, from 2020 to 2021, democracies are expected to do better because they aren't going to tax as much and therefore the economy is lower taxes, better economic growth. On the other side, from 2020 to 2030, we expect authoritarian governments to do slightly better under the second argument because democracies are going to tax more for certain things but they're going to put all of the expenditures, they're going to spend all the money on immediate consumption. We're not going to worry about infrastructure. Infrastructure is a big issue in, in many states, right? It's a big issue here and now, right? But one of the things that we see as, in the United States as a democracy is, is very poor roads and bridges because the investment is never in the long term. It's always in the one year to the next year, right? We want to deal with immediate consumption, right? Tax dollars are going to issues that are right now. Right? It's very easy to get a democracy to deal with an issue that's happening right now. Right? COVID relief is, is, is very easy to pass right? in many states. Right? But in democracies, so is I need food and I need shelter and I need things right now. We also see a connection between democracies and labor unions. Right? Organized labor is, is, very, is always connected to democracy. Right? As soon as you allow people the right to assembly and organize, right, as, as one of the criteria 
that exist in Doyle's, in Doyle's polyarchy, right, you're going to have higher wages, you're going to have demands for safer conditions, and they are working. Well, all of those things limit production, you have less production, and you have more costs, right, which means that the, the, the revenue is going to be, the profits are going to decline. Lower profits mean lower taxes, right, so there is more taxes, but they're growing less, because even though they're, 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 the taxes might be higher, they can only pull so much out of the system, and then because they can only pull so much out of the system and it has to be consumption, they can't invest in long-term growth. And so one of the arguments that comes about in the 20th century is this authoritarian modernizer argument. And so this, the way this argument works is that you have a autocratic government, you have some, um, you have some leader, right? And that leader says, I'm going to suppress labor wages. I'm going to force people to stop spending all their money on consumption, right? I'm going to decrease consumption here. And I'm going to take all that money and I'm going to build up the infrastructure. I'm going to modernize the state. And um, although there is some problems with authoritarian modernizer arguments, right? That, um, that all states are going to modernize eventually. Right? You need roads and bridges and technology. You need, like, every state needs these things. The argument um, of authoritarian modernizers and their value is often argued about this. this Unique people, right? And one of them is Riza Shah. Riza Shah is, uh, Riza Shah, um, I think it was Pahlavi. He is the leader of Iran from around the 1920s um, and then going into World War II. Eventually, he's, he's removed from power, and there's this whole Iranian history where Riza Shah leaves, and then they have this government, and then the United States reinstalls the Shah, and this leads to essentially a puppet government, or Iran, the domestic population is a puppet government, and then the Iran Revolution in 1979, where we have the Ayatollah Khomeini come in, and the, the um, theocratic, the religious government takes over in 79. But what matters for here, in this case, is that Riza Shah starts forcing his state to modernize. Now, he also does a few other things that are a little um, off. He, he's very against sort of head coverings. Um, he clearly has some like sec, uh, secular beliefs, right? His government and religion should be separate, right? Very influenced by the West, right? Because West believes that religion and government has to be separate. The, in the Middle East and, and, and East, in the Middle East and East Asia, this idea that religion and government have to be separate isn't really the standard. Um, in that, in that region, in the way that Western governments think you have to have a And Reza Shah is connected, right? He, he involved himself with the West and training with the West. And so there is some of that social connection that we talked about in the last section of the course, right? That he socialized and sort of this information of Western academies and universities and behavior, he pulled that back into a lot. But why he matters so much, he says, I'm going to force you to build roads and bridges. I'm going to force you to build infrastructure. And so for about the first two to three years, the Russo is in charge, consumption is down, and their economy is not growing as much. But what happens is Iran goes from an agricultural society, a society that has a low economic growth rate, that doesn't really have infrastructure, to this highly, this highly developed state with great growth, great systems. And when we see that what that does is establish them to build more infrastructure, more industry. And now we look at, even, even though Iran and, and, and is sort of isolated without the sanctions because of the nuclear program, what we see is a highly developed system, right? A highly developed system through this modernizer. And so what happens is this argument starts to occur that while democracies might be better in the first year in, in economic growth, they don't invest in the future. And so what, what we see is a decrease in economic growth over time, over a five, ten-year period. And so this is how China goes to the five-year plan, ten-year plan. And we get this argument that authoritarian governments are just better at economic growth. And in fact, if you look today, Iran is, is a supporting example of this. Um, one of the things that's very unique is, is starting in the 1970s, um, you see this pull away, right? In, in, in the Cold War, Iran is, is, buff, is a buffer between the United States and the Soviet Union. And so relations between Iran and the U.S. are really good. They, they're very strong relationships. But when the Ayatollah comes in and sort of removes the Shah and it becomes a theocratic government and 
you have all these sanctions come on uh, on Iran, right? They're, they're not they don't have the same connection to the West they did, but they still develop through this modernization, through this authoritarian modernization. They still develop one of the best scientific communities in the world, right? If you look at medical research that involves um, nuclear research, right? Nuclear medicine, one of the most advanced in the world is Iran, possibly more advanced than the United States. There are treatments, there are medical treatments that exist in Iran that the U.S. doesn't have access to, right? In the same way that um, Europe has medical treatments that the U.S. doesn't have access to. In fact, the, the U.S. medical system is lagging behind multiple states in different arenas. So, right, obviously that authoritarian Iran has just set up a system in which that state keeps succeed, even when it's a weaker state in, in a larger community, right? So authoritarian Iran does really have the power to develop an economy, long-term economic growth through investments, right? And this just isn't, isn't Iran, right? We already talked about the South Korean example already, right? We can talk about China, right? China really suppressed its wages, and now if we look at it today, right? It, it, one, of, one of the really big, strange and sort of positive changes in the 21st century is that almost a billion people have been pulled out of poverty in that region because of that long-term economic growth plan. Right. Whether or not it's sustainable, whether or not we'll have this right, that's not clear, right? But we typically agree that people shouldn't live in poverty, right? And this authoritarian behavior in India and China, India is, India is very clearly a democracy, but economically, it has some authoritarian principles about trade. That region pulled a billion people out of poverty. What we would consider poverty, they're still probably under the poverty line in the American status, but out of extreme poverty that they were in, bringing them into the formal economy, right? And so there's a strong argument with historical examples that this argument works. Now, that's a problem, right? Because we just said that democracies were bad at economic growth, and now we're saying long-term economic growth is broken. Well, they can't both be better at economic growth, right? This is a crazy thing that we have to talk about here. So the first part that we get into that helps solve this uh, answer is quasi-voluntary quasi uh, compliance. I want to make sure I can get slides. I want to try to get through everything today. So, what we see in quasi-voluntary experiments is, is, contact, is contacted. We've talked about this before. And quasi-voluntary means uh, you're more willing to accept the, this regime, right? No one's going to say, you didn't tax me enough, you need to tax me more. We have a very, very rarely, um, um, some very wealthy people in Western states have sort of said, we need to be taxed at a higher rate for the system to work. But that's actually self interested. If there's not higher taxation on the wealthy, um, it's likely that, that right, the people in the lower, middle lower income and lower incomes will start to behave very differently, right? That, there's self-interest involved in that. What our argument is, is that when you have taxation, there has to be some aspects, right? But when you're having taxation, if you believe that the taxes are used to provide very valuable public goods that you need, then you're less likely to obey taxation, right? If you think taxes are going to firefighters and national defense and education and things that are really valuable to all the people involved, then you're like, yeah, we should pay our taxes because we need, we need these things. We need roads and bridges and, and firefighters and national defense. Because those are really the only things that people agree should be taxed, right? But very few people would say, we don't need better roads, right? Especially in Nevada, right? And I've, I've, I've lived in multiple states, right? But California and Nevada don't have great roads, right? And they're highly, right, for different reasons, they have poor roads, but, right, Nevada, road taxes are road conditions, right? And so, when we look at these states, if we believe that our taxes were going to these things, we'd be less likely to work. The other part, which we've talked about already, is there has to be some assurances that the taxpayers will pay their taxes and the government will actually use those taxes appropriately. Right? There has to be trust. Right? Assurances, when you believe there are assurances, that's just basically trust. And we see in the United States, right, one is that we believe that we should pay our taxes. We don't want to, but we believe that we should pay our taxes. But also we think, well, we don't pay our taxes, something bad will happen. Right? That's, that's the comparison to the Greek example that we saw in the, in the debt crisis 
to be 10 years ago. I think it's been 10 years. And so Greece was like, well, I'm not going to get caught, and I don't think free, the free government is going to spend the money appropriately. There's so many bureaucratic jobs that are just draining this money. So I'm not going to pay taxes just for it to get wasted, just to pay someone's salary who doesn't do anything. So you don't have the insurances, you don't have the perception. And so Greece found it very difficult, the, the Greek state found it difficult to fund the taxation because they had what's called a commitment problem. Right? People couldn't hold to their agreement. Right? And a commitment problem just means that you won't stay with things that, you're, that you agree to, right? that you're always backing out of agreements. And commitment problems are a very big issue. We, just, we won't talk about it as much because commitment problems come up more often in, in international relations. So this introduces this concept of what are called a frequency-dependent problem. Um, and this is not in this article, but I, I want you to know this part. A frequency-dependent problem is something where if you have a small percentage of the population doing it, then it's not an issue. Right? If 1% of, of any state is unemployed, then you have a fantastic economic system. Right? It's very easy to support 1% unemployment. Right? And in fact, full employment is 5% unemployed. Right? Because some people will lose a job for a couple weeks, and people are in transition. So if you have under 5% employment, you're as full employed as you can get. Because when, when the people on employment get new jobs, some people get fired, some people lose their job, or, right? there's always this transition. So if you only have 5% unemployment, you're fantastic. Anything under 5% is fantastic. Right? So that's a low percentage. When you start to get an 8 to 9%, right, why is it such a big deal? It's because the system can only absorb so much right? as, as unemployment percentage goes up. And this is frequency dependent. Right? So between 1 and 2%, um, don't pay their taxes every year in, in, in Western states. One in two percent. Right? One, in, one out of every hundred people don't pay their taxes. Now, that may not be tax evasion. Maybe they didn't pay enough through the year. Right? But, but my, many people in my family claim four people. Even if they don't have four dependents, they'll claim four people. Right? And, and economically, you can claim a bunch, invest that money, and then when it comes to pay taxes, you actually are better off. Right? But what they do is they spend that money, and then when it comes to taxation, they owe and they can't pay it, and then they have to make a deal, but they're not paying taxes. But the amount of people who do that are very low. Most people claim what they're supposed to claim, and then essentially what they do is they pay the government throughout the year, and it's kind of like you're paying a bill in January six months ahead of time. And so the government gets a little extra because you're paying it so early, but most people agree to that system, and it helps it work. Now, if everyone said, legally, I can get away with claiming two or three more dependents than I actually have, but I'll have to pay more taxes at the end of the year, then every tax season, we'd have this huge problem. And throughout the year, we'd have a lack of resources going into the system. Right? And so this is very frequency dependent. And we want to make sure that we're comparing this, why is it so important to have a frequency dependent problem? Because is this an issue where it's isolated, where it's an isolated incident? Right? There's only a couple people are doing it, it's not an issue, or is it systemic? Is this an issue that's so widespread that it's going to be a problem, right? Governments can always absorb a certain amount, right? In fact, companies do the same thing. We, sometimes we call this shrink. Um, in, in a corporate system, we call it shrink, right? Shrink means what's damaged, stolen, right? That you're going to lose a percentage of your goods. They're not, if you're in a business, right, you're not going to get everything out the door, right? So if you're losing 1% to 2%, okay, that's fine. Some, 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 some objects are going to get dropped, people are going to steal, right? We have to allow for a certain amount of theft, right? There's people are, things are going to happen where less than 100% of your goods are actually going to make it out the door as a sale, right? And so the same is true in government, right? Not everyone's going to comply. As the percentage increases, the problem increases. And there's a book by, um, by Olson, Mansur Olson, who wrote a book in 1965, called The Logic of Collective Action, we talk about free rides and free riders, right? Free riders are people who don't contribute but use the resource, right? And you can absorb some free riders, you just can't absorb a lot, right? There's only so much you can absorb. Um, and he uses, I think he uses like a bus as an example, right? If one person doesn't pay a bus fare, no one cares, right? Because there's so many bus riders. But if half the people aren't paying the fare, then, right, the bus can't afford to be even, can't, bus routes can't even afford to ride. Right? And so there's all these operations for that. So frequency-dependent problems are how governments work. Right? 
a low percentage of the population behaving a certain way, not an issue. As the percentage increases, then it becomes more of a problem. So now let's look at the model we're creating. And when you're reading this, there's like an F, there's a symbol F that they use. I, I don't want you to worry about this as much. Um, just like me about this. All right. So th th I'm just showing this. So when you see an F function and then it's like very um, So this F, for those of you, I'm just telling you so that you know, but I don't expect you to know this is something. This means a function of, um, and so unless you've had like, I think it's like pre-calc or something like this, you won't see this function of, right? But essentially it means an interaction where this is the, the number in front of the variable and this is the first variable. And it's just this function is some way that these variables interact to produce a result, right? And so don't, don't worry about that part, right? In fact, even when everything comes up that's math or that's methodology, right? Don't you don't have to know the methodology. We have you, all of you will have to take a statistics course or a methods course for any major, right? It, it's unavoidable, right? English majors have to take statistics now, I think, right? For most schools. So don't worry about that now. There'll be a class for that. What I do want you to look at is the actual variables. What are we talking about, right? And in this model. They break down taxation, right, what in, impacts the level of taxation, into four different aspects. Transaction costs. Transaction costs and how much it costs to implement the policy, right? How much does it cost to collect a certain amount of taxes, right? A tax collector and a the bureaucracy costs money. So if it costs you $10 to collect taxes, and every time you collect taxes, you collect $100, then the transaction cost of $10 decreases the amount you bring in. Right? You collect $100 in taxes, but it costs you $10 to collect it, that's a transaction cost. And transaction costs occur every time you have a government interaction. There is always a transaction cost in, in government interaction. It doesn't matter what the government is doing, there always is some cost to the policy. Right? Because you have, to have, you have to pay someone's salary, you have to pay for a phone call, you have to pay for an internet connection, there is always a transaction cost. You can shrink it, you can minimize it as much as possible, right? You can decrease transit, but you can't eliminate transaction costs. There is always some cost associated with, with collecting money, with doing anything in a government. In fact, all behaviors have transaction costs, right? You coming to class costs you gas money, you staying home means you have to pay for an internet connection, right? It might be very minimal because you already have an internet connection, but there's still a transaction cost involved. The next is a discount rate, and we'll talk about a discount rate because it's a little more complicated, but I, we'll get into that as we go through the slides. Bargaining power is just how much leverage you have over the other person, right? How much do they need you, and how much do, do you need them, right? Who, who has the power in the situation, right? Democratic governments really need the support of their, of their people because they rely on taxes, right? And that, and that voluntary, that quasi-voluntary compliance, right? That you have to be able to, Democratic governments are very reliant on their people. Authoritarian regimes, if they're an oil regime and they get their resources through rents, they don't aren't reliant. So they have stronger, they have a better position, they have better bargaining power versus their, their constituents and versus their population. And then fiscal requirements, um, what does the state need to spend its money? Remember the last article, the fiscal requirements for war were like 60-70% for many of these states. So this becomes a huge part. Taxation tied to how much money you're spending. So when we're talking about transaction costs, we really want to look at um, what, what, what is causing the transaction costs. And there are four variables that impact this. The first is the GDP per capita. Higher wages, easier to tax, right? And we'll talk about that in a second. I'll just talk about it now because I don't want to, I want to make sure we get out of here by 1110. When you have a modern economy, it's monetized, which means people are paid in currency, right? Um, something we won't have a, a chance to talk about uh, is formal economy versus informal economy. Um, this is actually part of the feminist literature. Um, and, and feminist, feminist literature, feminist theories, 
um, are usually more put into uh, in international relations. That's why we don't talk about, like I actually talk about feminist theory in Political Science 231, um, but it is part of that literature. And the reason why I bring it up is because it introduces in, an informal economy and a formal economy. And the, what a, the part about a formal economy that really matters here, in this case, is that people are paid in dollars. Taxable, trackable dollars. In the informal economy, um, it's something like one person washes all the kids, and then the other person does all the laundry, and then, and, right, I know I'm using very sort of stereotype behavior, but these are informal economy behaviors, right? And a third person does all the cooking, right? And no one's getting paid in money, which means you can't tax it, it's hard to quantify how much it's worth, right? And one of the issues about feminist theory that, that comes up, right, and this is not uh, normative, this is academic, right? Is that the reason why we don't value the informal economy is because it's not taxable, there's no money involved, there's no money exchanged. When you have money exchanging hands, usually it's formalized. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay you so much per hour. Well, if I'm going to pay you so much per hour, I'm going to report how much I'm paying you per hour to the government, and then they know exactly how much to tax you. Right? Taxing is very easy when you have that formalized income. Right? And so that's why it matters and why I brought up feminist theory. And quick aside, because I have, I think I have a minute. Whenever we talk about feminist theory, there's two different things. There's radical feminism and then there's liberal feminism, and they don't connect to what is like society we believe, right? Society has this idea of what feminism is. In political science, feminism means very specific things, right? And typically involve like women involved in the formal economy, barriers to the formal economy um, that are based on sex, right? That, Females are, are banned from certain jobs, right? Um, and then, right, in, in government behavior, right, a lot of it is gender, right, that there's very masculine behavior, stuff like that. So that is something that we talk about in a different course. What matters here is that because the formal economy is based on dollars and it is tracked, it's easy to tax. The next thing is trade, and trade is physical borders. We talked about this, right? But anytime you have goods coming in and out, they have to go through customs. And in the 20th century and the 21st century, especially today, everything gets tracked. Everything is tracked through a border, and so you have to pay customs. So even before the 21st century, it was very easy to get your taxes through trade because of those physical borders. They had to go through a port city. They had to go through certain aspects. And so customs agents were very effective at collecting taxes well before all jobs become formalized income. Right? So the formal economy grows after customs grows. Right? And so these are both very ways to get taxation. So if you have a lot of trade and you have a formal economy, then taxation is going to be higher because it's easier. And then mineral rents, uh, mineral uh, production usually tied to rents when it's state owned. And this is a, another way that you can make money, but it's not as productive as, as income taxes and trade. Right? And then agricultural production is just a, a way to say that it's not a large economy, right? Agricultural, what we call agrarian economies, where most of the economy is in farming, they don't produce a lot of wealth because a lot of the food is sustenance, right? A lot of the food is being eaten rather than sold, and so it's not producing much. So the, the more, the, the larger the agricultural sector in any economy, the smaller the economy will be, right? One of the concerns about the American system is that we have a shrinking agricultural economy. Well, of course we have a shrinking agricultural economy, as the economy grows, the percentage that is dedicated to farming will decrease. But that doesn't mean there's less food, that just means the relative value of food is declining. Now, does that mean the price of food? No, right? But, but because the agricultural sector is a smaller portion of, of, the, uh, of the economy, that means the economy is larger, right? So a large agricultural sector means a small economy, which means less taxes. So that's the first part about how we determine taxation. The next part is this discount rate. So a discount rate is just how much you value the future. If I offered you $20 today, and I said, you can take this $20 today, or I can give you $100 a year from now, you would probably take the $20. In part, because you may not trust me to pay you $100 a year from now. $100 a year from now, you're like, well, I, I don't know what you're going to do. You're not going to be my 
instructor. I'm not going to be in your course, but how am I going to contact you? Will you have that money then, right? So a lot more people will say, I would rather take a point ours now because of a trust issue. That's one part of a discount rate. The other part of a discount rate is $20 today might be much more valuable than $100 later, right? If you don't have money for food today, you're going to take the $20, right? Maslow's higher than he is, right? If you don't have food or shelter, you're going to, whatever money I can get right now to solve today's problems, you're going to take. In the, in the future, I don't know where I'll be at. I don't know if $100 will matter to me. I don't know if it'll have the same impact that $20, right? Because the more money you have, the less valuable increasing money has, and diminishing returns that we talked about, right? That if you, if you have $1,000, $10 isn't as important to you. If you have no money, $10 is very important to you. So discount rate is whether or not you're looking at short-term goals or whether or not you're trying to worry about long-term goals. And so this is that disconnect between democracy and authoritarian regime, right? Democracies might fail to develop infrastructure. They may not develop the economic growth sector. They might not invest in industry. They might not prepare for some things, right? One of the things is, why is the American system, which is the largest economy in the world, why was it so unprepared to deal with vaccines, and why were vaccines developed and distributed at a faster rate in other states? Well, one is the size of our country. It's much larger and has other issues. But the other is that, as a system, we have not developed an infrastructure that deals with large-scale response and medical systems, right? We have, we have one of the worst organized medical systems that exists, right? So that's part of being a democracy. We don't, right, economic interests and corporations, right, are dealing with other factors that don't align with just providing medical services, but also deal with economic incentives for those corporations. So that's right. We didn't invest in those things, right? We saw that after the H1N1 uh, flu, right, the swine flu. It's H, I think it was an avian or swine flu. But the H1N1, right, we, we had this flu virus come about. It depleted our reserve of masks and, and um, other PPE, personal protective equipment. And no administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, neither administration worked to replenish that, that resource. Right? There wasn't a push to replenish, right? because democracies aren't looking at three, four years in the future, they're looking at right now. And why spend on something that is not going to come up in the future? Remember in 2016, 2017, even 2018, right? there's, no, there's no COVID, it doesn't exist. Right? We don't know about it, we don't need this. And so there's no reason to invest in that PPE except to prepare for the future. And because there's no direct threat, democracies aren't going to prepare for those direct threats. That's why some states were so much more prepared to respond. Right? Especially authoritarian governments, right? China has always been prepared because they've developed a backlog of, of resources. Right? That's why China was shipping out N95s well before the American system could produce enough for its population to meet. So democracies have that problem where they're not preparing for the future. However, authoritarian governments may not prepare for the future either. Right? If you're a kleptocracy, if you're Mubarak and you're like, I'm going to lose power this year. You don't invest in the future. You steal as much money as you can and you get out of there. So yeah, you might raise taxes, but you don't put that into coffers. You don't save that money. You just put that in your bank account and run, right? And so both governments, both regime types, might behave differently based on how they think the future is going to go. Right? This becomes part of the issue. What is the future going to hold? How much do I value the future? Do I care about what's happening in five years, right? American presidents and don't care about what's happening in five years because they're a four-year term, right? In England, the concern is not three years from now, it's right now, because if you don't make it through this vote, right, the vote of no confidence will have you removed, right? And, and in any parliamentary system, if you're not responding to the, this moment, right, there'll be a vote of no confidence, and you can be ruled from power, right? Parliamentary systems don't always have terms, right? That at any point, the, the leaders can be ruled from power by a vote of no confidence. So when you have something like that, you have to deal with right, right now, right? If it's, if it's 2012 and it's the Arab Spring and you're the leader of Libya or Tunisia or Egypt, you're like, I need to deal with right now. There's no future after this, right? The, the Mubarak and, and Gaddafi, right? They couldn't deal with later. They had to deal with now, right? And, and Gaddafi died, right? He, he was murdered, right? He was murdered and he was stabbed, right? But Gaddafi died 
because he was dealing with the short term, right? He couldn't respond to that short term issue. He'd been in power for a long time. He couldn't respond to that short term issue. So the later doesn't matter, right? Later just definitely doesn't matter in that case. The next is bargaining power. Bargaining power is how dependent, right? We talked about this. If you have independent rights, this is the research person, well, we talked about this before. I don't want to spend too much time on it, right? You're not going to respond, respond to your people if you don't need them, right? But if you rely on popular taxation, if it's income and sales tax that keeps your government going, then you're going to really need the people. And the people have a lot of say over what happens, right? And so the bargaining power. When you have high, when you have income taxes as your major source of revenue, then the people have all the power. When it's rents that give you your revenue, then the government has the power and the people don't. Right now, for the people, right, if they're if they're patronage jobs and they rely on the government for services, right, that why has why isn't anyone challenging Social Security in the United States? Why is universal health care not challenged in the United Kingdom anymore? Why have those challenges gone away? Right. Um, Initially, when the United Kingdom went to universal health care or socialized medicine, there were a lot of people fought against it. But now they're all in that system. They're all in that system getting free or extremely low cost health care. No one's fighting against that. In the New Deal era, there were a lot of people who were against Social Security. They didn't think that, that there should be forced retirement savings, right? They didn't think it should happen. But now everyone's been paying into it for a long time and we rely on it. Senior citizens rely on Social Security, but no one's fighting against Social Security to get rid of it. Right? And so over time, people become dependent on the systems and they're impossible to get removed. The other part is patronage jobs. Right? Many sub-Saharan African states deal with this as part of their problem, is that so many people rely on the government for a job, they don't want any changes. Right? And so the government is really struggling to pay, but as long as they can pay for those patronage jobs, they get control over that population because those jobs help them live. Right? Those are the only jobs available in that system. Right? So patronage jobs really make people dependent on the government and allows the government to do the things that they want because they can say, if you don't work with us, we'll cut these patronage jobs. And then, of course, we have to deal with the difference between elite bargaining and populist bargaining. Now, elite bargaining is when you go to the elites and you say, I want something. Right? This is the English model, the historical English model. Right? That the king goes and says, I need money for warfare, and the elites say, well, we want something in exchange. That's a leap bargaining model, right? What, what, what do we have to offer each other? That's contract theory, right? I'll offer you protection, but, but you have to get pay me more in taxes. That's a leap bargaining. Populist bargaining is where you go directly to the people and you say, hey, we really want this, and I'm going to raise taxes. And usually what a government does is it goes to elite bargaining first. It's easier to bargain with elites. But if you can't get your way with elites, then you go public. It's called going public, right? And you go and you say, I want this really populist behavior, right? This is the Bernie Sanders model, right? For those of you that, like, all of you should know Bernie Sanders, I know. He was like, yeah, let's tax the rich, right? We are the 99%, we should be taxing. That's a populist model, right? The elites aren't going to agree to it. They're definitely not going to agree to be taxed at a higher rate. But the majority of people don't, aren't in that group. So we should tax that elite group more to pay for services. Right? That's a populist bargaining power. Right? And obviously it's very effective because the people who are getting taxed more aren't in that populist group, and that populist group will see benefits without costs. And I'm not trying to be conservative or fiscally conservative or anything like that. Right? You can always have a populist movement when you say the things that the majority of people want and try and encourage them to override any minority interests. And minority, I just mean the smaller part, portion of the population, not ethnicity or racial. The other part is bargaining power can go over time. Right? Mubarak had a great deal of bargaining power before the Arab Spring because he'd been in office for a long time. Right? People believe that. And so when you have an election, for a few years after the election, there's a lot of power that the government has. And if it stabilizes, it will bring more and more power because there's trust and there's belief that the administration will stay in power. Right? Administration and government are exchangeable here. The administration being who's in charge, the executive leader. When you have a regime change, the new regime may not be trusted as much because it hasn't built up that system. Or it might be trusted more because it has new energy, right? depending on the, the, the specifics of that context, or that, the specifics of that case. The next, we talk about fiscal requirements. Right? So this is the fourth factor. 
When you talk about physical requirements, warfare still has a high set, but you don't have as many states building and going to wars. So taxation starts to become part of what is the debt. How much debt does that state have? Because the more they have to pay debts off, right, in the same way that you would have to do, right, if you have a credit card and you have to make that credit card payment every month, that means you have less money to go to your monthly expenses, right? The state works the same way, right? The state economic behavior and personal economic behavior aren't different in behavior, they're different in scale, right? And governments can deficit spend, which we'll talk about later. So the first part is if you're in a lot of debt, right, then you can't spend on other services. So that's going to cause you to need higher taxes. I need to raise taxes so I can pay this debt and I can pay the services. Right? In the same way, if you were deeply in debt, you're like, I need to make more money so I can pay off my bills and still pay for food and groceries and a house. Right? So the, the behavior is very similar. Now, deficit spending is essentially I'm going to borrow money. I'm going to borrow the money to spend on these services, and then eventually, as my economy grows, I'll be able to pay back that debt. Right? This is the American model. This is um, Keynesian economics, for those of you who have studied that. Right? Keynes says, when, when the economy goes down, the government should spend and help the economy go back up. Right? And spend money it doesn't have. Right? Borrow and spend. And then when it's going up, it should raise taxes. Right? This is the Hayek model. It should raise taxes so you don't have a boom and bust cycle. Raise taxes and take those taxes and pay off the debt and put into savings so that you can spend in the next um, bust cycle. Right? Boom and bust is a natural cycle, and so those things happen in that behavior. The other part which happens in democracies are what's called uncontrollable expenditures, right? You have to pay Social Security recipients, right? This is called entitlements, right? So you have patronage jobs, right? Uncontrolled expenditures might be patronage jobs. People have jobs, you have to pay them their salary. If you're hiring people to get support from the government, if you're an authoritarian regime and you're hiring people for support, then it's going to cost you money to maintain that support. Entitlements is you make an agreement. You say you have to pay into these taxes and then when you retire, you'll get Social Security. Unemployment insurance in many states, right? Unemployment isn't something you just get. You pay into front of all of you, all of you who are working in the formal economy, you pay a certain amount of money as unemployment insurance. And then when you are employed, laid off, whatever it is, then the government is required to cover you to pay, pay unemployment because you paid into that system. Now, there, there might be a lot of ways, right, that, that um, John Oliver covered uh, the, the former Florida governor and said he had a state of 22 million people and only 61,000 of them were on unemployment. It's very low. So there, obviously there are ways to sort of make the rules harder so it's hard to get unemployment. But for the most part, these entitlements are something the government has to pay. They don't have a choice. They have to pay out these things. Entitlements are uncontrollable because you have to pay. And the amount of people who get these entitlements aren't connected to what the government is doing. It's tied to the environment. Right? More unemployment means the government has to pay out more. The elderly living longer means the government has to pay out more. Right? Medical costs increasing means the government has to pay out more for Medicare and Medicaid and Medi-Cal and whatever the other types of, of, of government-supported insurance there is. Right? And so these cause taxation to be higher because the requirements are higher. It's harder for them to cover them. And so as you get heavily indebted, you just can't spend on public goods. The level of public goods decreases. The cost of those public goods increases, right? Bus fares go up, right? Toll roads start to increase in, in frequency and cost, right? And then also, right, when it becomes very dangerous, we talked about, when Scottsdale talked about civil war, if you can't continue to fund your elites or provide them with certain resources, they're going to fracture, right? They're going to split apart, and some elites are going to want to change the government, right? And so elite fracture is always a risk when you're heavily indebted. So now let's look at this expanded model, right? What really matters? And so we talked about transaction costs, discount rate bargaining, power and fiscal requirements. And so what we add is we need to understand that, yet yeah, all of these things matter, but what impacts these when it comes to a political sense, political science sense, right? Because this is mostly economics, but in a political science sense, covering this, is that we also have to add elections administrative changes, regime changes, debt, and grants, right? And grants we're not going to worry about. Um, it's, it's not really worth it going into as much. Right? So if you're heavily indebted, you have to raise taxes. If you just had a regime change, your new regime might be so different that taxation will change. 
right? That if you if you have an error of spring and suddenly right the entire environment changes, you have to develop a new taxation system. If you have an administration change where the president or the executive is replaced by a new president or executive, then the new rules might change, but also the trust is different, right? Because how long will this person be in power? Is this person going to be able to, to have the compliance, right? Will people trust them enough to be somewhat voluntary, com voluntarily compliant when it comes to taxation? And then elections, right? Elections always matter in political science, right? As you come up near an election, you'll see partisanship increase, but then after election, you will either see a fraction of society, right, where a part of society is unwilling to cooperate with a new, with a new administration, or you see this coming together of society, right? That's the New Deal and FDR, um, that's elections in, in newly democratic states that everyone sort of comes under the new party and says, okay, how do we make this work, right? So elections always have an impact. So then there's some empirical analysis, um, right? And, and I, I don't want to go into the tables, right? We're not getting into the math, but right, transaction costs are significant. When you have higher incomes in trade, you have higher taxation because the transaction costs decrease, right? If I can just tax your income and you get a W-2 every year or whatever the tax document is that, that says your income, it's going to be easier to tax you. If you bring in shipping containers that are labeled and go through customs, then it's easier to tax. So taxation increases when you have lower transaction costs. And that should make sense, right? The, the easier it is to tax, the higher tax should be because it's something that's functional, right? right? And the revenue will go up because the cost of collecting those taxes will be higher. Discount rate and tax taxation, but it really has this idea of patience, right? How much do you discount the future? Discount rate is how much you discount the future. If you're in a high risk regime, you're going to raise taxes dramatically. Right? If you're like, we're not going to be in power next year. So I'm going to make the taxes 90%. I'm going to take all the money I can and I'm going to run it. So when you have a high risk regime, when it's likely that they're going to be out of power, we should taxes, taxes increase dramatically. Democracies always have a lower tax regime, or typically have a lower tax regime in the theoretical arguments. But what we see, Right, we'll talk about this in a second. Is that democracy typically tax more than the authoritarian governments? And we'll, we'll deal with how that matters in the last slide. Bargaining power is only taxed by elections. The only thing that matters empirically and we have to bargain power is elections. Before an election, um, everyone's going to say no new taxes, right? This, there's this very famous example um, George W. George Herbert Walker Bush, who was president from 1988 to 1992. He was running in 1988 against Walter Mondale. And Walter Mondale says, there's going to be new taxes. There's no way around it. There's going to be new taxes. And uh, Bush says, read my lips. Right? It's very famous saying, read my lips to the new taxes. Well, the first thing that, that George Herbert Walker Bush does when he becomes president in 88, one of the first things that happens is raise his taxes. Because they both understood that taxes had to be raised to cover the expenses of the state that existed. But one of them, through the election, was making a campaign promise they knew they couldn't keep in order to win the election. And so elections have this really big impact because before elections, you have a lot of people saying that they don't want to raise taxes. And then after elections, you have this momentum that says, well, I have a mandate of the people. The people need this. Right? Even if you don't keep with your promises, likely you get enough support that you can do things you couldn't do before election. So elections really matter. And that, that case is very uh, unique because it's widely believed that Mondale was going to win, and he said that. He said, we're going to raise taxes. There's no way around. He was very honest, right? Very, very honest. From Walter Mondale in that moment, um, he was the Democratic National Committee. He, he was a Democratic uh, candidate for president, and on his convention speech, he says, I'm going to be very honest with you, yeah, raise taxes. And it probably cost him the election, right? So this idea of how elections work, how campaigning works, what the behavior before and after elections, elections really matter, right? Speaking to an audience matters meant for that's that's a much more complicated concept that's not really appropriate for doing all of this. And then fiscal requirements, right? A balanced budget is not a state priority. A, a, a state, most states are not concerned, and I mean states in a little broader sense, because Nevada has a balanced budget, it causes no other problem, right? But states within the United States, right, the the like Nevada, California, they can't really deficit spend in the same way. There are a lot of rules about that. You can't have states going into debt because the federal government would have to bail them out, right? So there's all these arguments about that. 
but states in, in, in the political science concept, right, the United States and Greece and, and the United Kingdom and Russia, they often take on debt, right? They deficit still. And so balancing the budget, making sure we're out of debt is not an issue, right? We look well over $17 trillion in debt in the United States. Right? Greece had this where they had so much debt that they couldn't do about it. There are what are called heavily indebted poor countries that can't function because they're so in debt, right? There are structural adjustment loans, the IMF and, and, and the World Bank, because they're so in debt that they can't even make their monthly payments, right? It's what's called the balance of payment problems. So when you're in debt that much, it really impacts taxation because you have to increase taxation dramatically just so you can pay your debts off, right? And your services are definitely going to get cut. So we have all these questions. So let's go back to the original point, right? That this happens a lot in, in academic work, right? The original argument was, does regime type matter? Well, the first part is, it doesn't fit with the theoretical arguments. Democracies have higher taxation. If we just look at taxation levels, democracies have higher taxation. It's only about 1% higher. It's only about 1% difference. It's a very small difference between authoritarian governments and, and democratic regimes, authoritarian regimes and democratic regimes. But it doesn't fit with our life. Right? We think democracies are going to tax less because they, they are only concerned about this year, or they have to get the support of the voters and worry about the election. All of these things, but democracies have higher taxation. It doesn't fit with our theoretical arguments. So this sort of doesn't answer the question, but it seems like what we think is the theoretical arguments that really apply. The next part is a selection bias or indoctrination. Democratic regimes typically have higher GDP. Right? This, this is not like, there are a lot of arguments about this happens. We can talk about this in modernization theory, right? Modernization theory or, or economic theory, right? That you have to have a certain level, many of them argue that you have to have a certain level of economic growth and a high level of GDP in order to be democratic. So if higher GDP means higher taxation and democratic regimes are tied to higher GDP, then there's a correlation there that is because we're looking at the same thing, right? As economic, as economies grow, taxation and democracy tends to democracy grow. So this is problematic, right? But we can't really answer the question with this paper. So we get to this is not clear, right? This is, this is, this can happen, right? This is a scientific approach, right? One of the things that can happen in a scientific approach is you can say no, it's not clear. It's not clear that regime type dictates taxation. It's not clear whether or not regime type has an impact. What is clear is that what our theories expect isn't fitting with historical models, right? Our theories expect democracies to tax less and authoritarian governments to be better at infrastructure and, and economic development all the time. None of that's matching with the data sets. And so that's very important to discuss, right, that we're not getting into clear answers. And so regime type and the type of government might have an impact and we're going to have to look at this a little more in a little bit more detail to get some answers. Right? Yes, taxation increases and state behavior consolidates with warfare and taxation, but regime type does not seem to be connected. Right? That if you have an external threat or if you have a rivalry, you're going to build up a stronger military, you're going to centralize your taxation, and you're going to build a modern state. But whether or not you're an authoritarian government, an autocracy, an oligarchy, a democracy, a competitive authoritarian regime, that doesn't seem to be the largest issue. All states are going to develop centralized taxation and sort of a, a rivalry or external threat reason for building up the military and centralizing and centralizing their taxation, but regime type does not seem to be a controlling factor. And so that doesn't mean it's not, it just means it's not clear that. So we covered a lot of material um, before we before we go. Um, we have, you'll see a quiz um, that will come up either today or tomorrow um, that, because I want to, to end before we go into, I want it to be available so we can finish it before we go into student two today. So next week we're going to talk about electoral systems. Um, I'm going to send, I'm going to add a, a note, but we're going to, the, the TRL, I think the TRL is very like methods heavy. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to do um, just the second and third article. 
And then the first article is actually going to be extra credit. I'll give you extra credit for that. But there'll be some write-up that you can use extra credit. And the same way that the former article was. And then we're really going to talk about first pass to post and, and proportional representation. And so these factors we're going to start talking about. In comparative politics, we think regime type matters, but one of the regime types is how people get chosen, right? And so we're going to look at electoral systems and democracy or, or competitive versus regime, depending on how they're classified. And we're going to talk about how they fit so that we understand what elections do. And then because elections clearly matter, we're going to talk about how elections and violence and incumbency, right? How elections impact this behavior, right? And so it's the, the second and third article really in detail. And then the first article, because it's so methods heavy, I think it's not as valuable. Um, well, I'm going to make that extra credit for those of you that, that, that need it. Right. Thank you very much. Um, I will post this recording. Um, and then if you need anything, right, my office hours are, are for now until about 12, 1230. Um, I, I'm not physically in my office, but if you email me, I can set up a, a WebEx or a chat or anything. So thank you, um, and have a good day.